How's it going, everyone? I'm Harrison, and uh, today we're going to be talking about this guy. What is this? This is the Walther Dynamic Performance Trigger for the uh, Q5 steel frame and Q4 steel frame. This is pretty new. Uh, just hit the streets about a month or two ago, I want to say. Um, as you may have seen in my other videos, I'm running the Overwatch Precision TAC Trigger over here in my... Uh, Q5 steel frames for competition for uh, quite some time now, uh, basically all of 2020. I really like this trigger. It's done a lot to reduce the take up and over travel, as well as give me a little bit more of a consistent trigger safety uh, versus the stock trigger. Additionally, it comes with springs that lighten the pull. Uh, I was already using Sprinko springs, so it didn't actually change my pull weight too much, but definitely changed where the trigger would break as well as where it would rest ordinarily. Now the way you see the tack trigger sitting in this gun probably looks the same as when I installed it on video before, and the same as it looks in this gun, but there's something a little bit different. And the trick is it's on the inside so you can't actually see it. Everything might look the same as you're used to, but the sear housing is different. So this is actually the Walther Dynamic Sear uh, that was introduced alongside with the Dynamic Trigger. You can buy it together or separately. I decided to pick one up and put it in my practice gun, see how I liked it. And it made a pretty big difference in my interaction with the tack trigger. And so far I've been actually really pleased with the way that the gun shoots now, uh, even more so than before. Now, as good as the tack trigger has been to me, I think with this sear housing, it's pretty clear that it's not optimized for that sear. And if this sear was like the standard one in the gun, Overwatch probably would design the trigger differently. So I'm excited to see how the Walther one that is designed specifically for that sear housing uh, compares to it. And so we'll be taking a look at this trigger actually in a gun with a standard and a gun with the upgraded sear housing, as well as uh, demonstrating what's different when you use the Overwatch trigger with the standard versus the upgraded housing. Before we get into the video, I'm not a certified gunsmith or armorer. I have no formal training. I am not authorized by any manufacturer to work on their firearms in any specific detail. And anything that you see on this channel may void your warranty. Follow my instructions with caution. All right, so I've got two guns here, uh, one of my match guns and my practice gun. Both of them have the Overwatch TAC trigger installed. Both of them have a reduced power trigger return spring. Uh, this one's got the Overwatch red spring, which is about they claim it's a 3.8 pound trigger pull. I actually think it's a little bit lighter than that. This one has the Sprinko spring in it. Now, the spring weight shouldn't really have a difference on anything other than the actual pull weight that we're seeing right now. What I'm gonna show you is actually differences in where the trigger uh, breaks and where you get to the wall. So, on the unmodified tack trigger, there's very, very little take up. You can, dis you can move the trigger about as far as the take-up goes without even disengaging the trigger safety. If you disengage the trigger safety, it just goes a smidge past that. It's a pretty short travel through the wall, and it breaks. And then it comes to rest just a little bit past vertical. So I'll do that again just so you get another shot at it. Take-up, very short, hits the wall. Wall takes a little bit of travel but it's consistent all the way through, then it breaks. And very little over travel afterwards. Reset comes out to here. Trigger breaks, minimal over travel. Put that one aside. This is the tack trigger with the Walther Dynamic Sear. So trigger rests in the same spot, but right off the bat, you see I have a whole lot more take up. I mean, look how much that trigger is moving. And what you'll see is my wall is actually past the vertical points. It's actually pretty close to where the other trigger was breaking. And there's a reason for that, because I barely even have to move this trigger before it breaks. And the reset is even shorter. Like, it's nothing. Now, the trigger breaking further back uh, from 90 degrees, for me, it 
bugs me just a smidge. Uh, but once I got used to this, I noticed that my uh, split times were getting a lot faster. It's definitely a lot easier to shoot off the reset with that shorter travel. So it feels a lot more like a like a 1911 in terms of where the wall is and how fast it breaks after the wall. But the take up reminds me in a bad way of the stock trigger, although it's definitely still shorter. And if you're comparing this, like if I put the stock trigger in with the sear housing, which I might do later, uh, the trigger would be way out here and it would have a whole lot of take up, take up before you hit the wall. So with that said, let's take this apart, throw the trigger in there and see what happens. So this is the factory Walther sear housing. So the sear is here. This is what's called the single action lever in Walther's terms. It's part trigger connector, part disconnector, actually. Uh, at least I'm pretty sure I'm getting that right. So the trigger bar has a little protrusion on it there. The trigger return spring hooks on here. And this pulls on the single action lever. It's kind of hard to see with it in there, so I will push on it with my punch, and you'll see the lever moves. Now, the sear, that part, is resting on this little shelf right here, and as the single action lever moves back, the sear can drop and release the striker. So this is what causes that, uh, that feeling of a wall. The wall is once this is starting to be engaged, by the trigger and the distance that it has to travel here before the sear can drop is the duration of that wall. Compare that with the dynamic sear housing, you'll notice right off the bat, if I put them side by side, you'll probably notice it even more. Uh, that single action lever is sitting way further back. And like you see right here, instead of coming all the way to the front, it's being pushed back a little bit. Now it's really hard to see Right there, you might be able to see it. There looks like there's a set screw in here, except it is hidden behind this. Uh, they like melted the plastic over it once they set it. Uh, my understanding is in Europe, there is a adjustable version of this. And down here, you can see the single action lever is just barely engaging the sear, really. Uh, so it just takes a little tiny bit of travel before it can drop. And that is, that's where the real money is, like this. This is a really, really short amount of travel. So that's why your wall is different, and it's also why the positioning of the wall is different, because the trigger bar doesn't engage until way further back. Now, there are ways to drill and tap your existing sear housing in just the right spot to do that. Uh, I'll be honest, I get a little nervous with that. Uh, I, I do actually kind of like that they uh, melted this over because it's adjusted to just the right spot and I know it's not going to back out on me. Um, I run my guns pretty hard so I'd be a little worried that was going to come out of adjustment. So, I mean, for the additional money, I can't remember exactly how much this is separately. I want to say it was like 75 bucks or something like that. I'd rather just have that and then I've got a whole backup sear housing if anything goes wrong. I could just throw the stock one in. The other thing I'll mention is the dynamic sear does actually come with its own uh, trigger return spring. I don't, I'm not using it. I actually have no clue uh, what weight it is. So I, I just really don't care. I have other springs that I know are reliable that I'd rather use. So we're gonna continue to use the uh, Sprinko trigger return spring for right now. I only recently went back to that one uh, when I put this sear housing in. Part of that, I'd been using the Overwatch uh, red trigger return spring. Uh, the reason being, it gave me a little bit of a, this is going to sound really weird as someone who really likes good triggers, uh, it gave me a more defined wall on the tr on the brake, so it, it just kind of felt a little crisper. It's kind of like the difference between a not-so-great 
three pound trigger and a good five pound trigger in a 1911. You know, just like really feels like a glass rod breaking. Uh, so I feel like when you're dealing with that longer travel for the break from the wall, the extra resistance kind of made it feel a little bit less mushy. Uh, but once I had very little travel, I kind of wanted to go back to the, the lighter spring. So two things I'm noticing right away, uh, very little travel at all. Um, and when it does travel, if I put pressure on top of the sear to simulate there actually being uh, a cocked striker, it like doesn't move at all. So this is actually really exciting. Uh, but the thing I noticed I don't like right away is the trigger safety blade is much harder to disengage, it seems. Uh, very much like the stock trigger. So it's likely that I'll have to modify it a little bit, uh, just like I did on my other guns. And I know lots of other people who had to do this uh, so that you don't have to get the whole finger into just the right spot to move the trigger. A lot of times in a competition setting under stress, you're going to come in a little off to the side or something like that. And you still want to be able to disengage that. Now, in uh, most competitions, you actually have to maintain the, in the integrity of the trigger safety. So it still has to function. Uh, and all my stock triggers I modified do retain that function. So you can see here, this is the trigger. And this little ledge right here is the part of the trigger safety that impacts the frame. So if I try to pull the trigger without depressing the trigger safety, it won't go. If I depress it all the way, it goes. You'll see if I depress it like here, it'll go. If I depress it from here, it'll go. If I depress it from here, it'll go. But if I come in, of course I won't do it now when I'm trying to show it. If I come in just a little bit off and I get enough pull on that trigger before the safety is fully disengaged, it'll actually bind up and you can't release the trigger and you can't depress the safety any further. Unless you pull really hard and then you drop the shot. All right, gun is reassembled. Striker is cocked. Come in here. That is like nothing in terms of pre-travel. In fact, I'm, before I even pull the trigger, I'm gonna show you on here. It's actually a pretty similar pre-travel to the unmodified uh, Overwatch trigger. So just like that tiniest little bit of movement before the wall. Same thing here. It is like almost is almost perfectly at that wall, except this is with the dynamic sear. So let's pull. Wow, you're you're kidding me, right? So you'll notice right away that it just sits just very slightly forward of 90 degrees. The wall is basically right at like 92 degrees and the brake is right at 90 degrees and there's basically no over travel. Wow. I can tell you right now, I, I'm already a big fan of this trigger. Uh, so I'm excited to get this out on the range. Uh, definitely expect, definitely expect a follow-up video on the range comparing the two. All right, so we've got the Lyman Digital Trigger Pull Gauge. Uh, I've got the gun in the vise to hopefully hold it consistently. I haven't quite got my technique down on this particular trigger safety yet, so let's hope that we are able to get a consistent reading. Two seven point seven gives us an average of two pounds six point two ounces uh, over. I don't know how many pull that, pulls that was. I wasn't counting. So we're looking at somewhere in like the low to mid two range for uh, trigger pull with just the sear, the trigger, and uh, like twenty five dollars worth of Springco springs. So I've got the 
uh, reduced power firing pin block spring and reduced power trigger turn spring, uh, which would normally give me about a three, three and a half pound trigger pull on a uh, unmodified gun. Yeah, the, the sear definitely does a ton to reduce the amount of travel required and the amount of wall that you're going to be dealing with. So I, I'm really impressed so far. If we want to do a little bit of compare and contrast, here is the gun with the Overwatch, with the red Overwatch spring in it. We'll do six pulls. So an average of two pounds, 13.8 ounces. This gun has the Overwatch trigger standard sear, Overwatch's red trigger return spring, which is their lighter one, and uh, the Sprinko firing pin block spring. Actually, I should say both guns also have the Sprinko uh, striker spring, but that uh, shouldn't really impact the uh, pull weight. That's more of a, a ignition pressure thing. So a couple things on the trigger pull techniques that seem to aggravate the trigger safety issue. If you come in and are very intentional about like the, the tip of your finger coming in on that first, you're unlikely to have any issues. The higher your finger wants to go on the trigger, the more likely you are to have an issue. Like it's very hard. I kind of have to come like over and back if I'm going to go super high on the trigger to do that. The lower you go, the more likely you are to get it, even with a less than ideal pull, but it's still possible to bind it up. So if you're slapping the trigger fast, like fingers hitting like this rather than like this, you're much more likely to aggravate the issue. Now, coming from up here, that is a harder motion to do on a repeated basis than this. The, the ideal trigger pull is, of course, you take the trigger, you slowly press it to the rear, uh, that's not realistic for a competition setting, especially if you want to go fast. Uh, the fast guys are usually really slapping the trigger. The difference is, as opposed to a normal shooter, they're slapping the trigger straight back and not inducing extra movement into the gun. I'm running into that problem, uh, even just playing with this here at the bench. So uh, I think the next step is going to be to take this out, uh, make some modifications to the trigger safety blade. Um, and while I'm at it, I'm actually going to put the standard sear back in so we can see how this trigger interacts with the normal sear. So we're going to go through something that was interesting that happened while I was uh, disassembling the gun uh, off camera, just because I didn't want to show you the same stuff a bunch of times. Uh, but as I was taking the slide stop out, watch what happens to the trigger. Pretty dramatically moves. Uh, and I guess I kind of just worked through it when I was assembling the gun in the first place. But part of what makes this trigger different than like the Overwatch, and it, this might actually persist without the dynamic sear, uh, where this trigger rests when there's nothing holding the, the pivot pin uh, hole on it is a little bit more like what you'd see on even the, the stock trigger is it's a lot more forward faced, uh, but they've really changed the geometry of the trigger relative to that hole massively. Um, so you have to kind of pull the trigger back and push it up just a smidge, uh, in order to line up the hole to put it back together. And likewise, as soon as you start to take it apart, it just goes into its resting position. So, uh, definitely some geometry stuff. This is why I was saying if this was the standard sear housing, uh, Overwatch probably would design their trigger a little bit differently. And as I suspected with the regular sear back in, uh, it's a little bit less pronounced, but it is definitely going to require the, the you know, pulling of the trigger a little bit to compensate for where it, its geometry wants it to rest as I install the slide stop. All right, guns back together. Standard sear, dynamic trigger. Um, you'll start to see here there's still not a ton of take up just based off the trigger geometry. I'd say it's similar, maybe even a, a bit less than the Overwatch. Yeah, coming from slightly forward set to 
a little before 90. So I'd say the Overwatch is actually probably uh, sitting from an angle wise, it's like a little bit closer to 90 at the wall with the standard sear. So just so we're, we're very clear, the dynamic, uh, fire control, the dynamic sear is not changing the position of the brake relative to um, the, the standard fire control group as far as I can tell. It's truly just about uh, changing up how, how long that wall is. So that's basically nothing. So you go from wall to instant break rather than long pulling through the wall like you'll see here. Once again, this is where I've hit the wall and you'll see where the trigger breaks significantly, actually significantly past 90. You hit the wall at 90 on the overwatch. On the dynamic with the way that it's set, you hit the wall a little before 90. With the standard sear, you'll break at 90. With the dynamic sear, you'll hit the wall at 90 and break, or like 92, something really close to that, and you'll break at 90. The other thing I'll say is the Overwatch pull does feel a little bit smoother relative to the, the dynamic, like the dynamic is a little bit grittier. I think that's because the uh, the trigger bar on the Overwatch is definitely a, a really smooth. Um, NP3 coated. Uh, I can't tell what kind of coating is on the on the dynamic triggers uh, trigger bar. I'm not a coating expert by any stretch of the imagination. I just pay people to do it for me. Uh, but it's a little noticeable, so I might actually end up taking uh, some time just to polish it up a little bit at some point. Uh, maybe not right away. Maybe after I've got a couple thousand rounds through, just see if it naturally smooths out on its own and if it is starting to smooth out and I want to accelerate the process, then I can see where it's uh, making contact specifically. There's one thing I just noticed. There's something different about the geometry of this nub right here. We'll talk about this a lot more in my full teardown video. This is the one that activates the safety plunger or uh, firing pin block. So you see it's kind of running a little bit more towards the inside of the slide when the slide's on here. So that's depressing on here. So they seem to have changed the geometry. It looks like it's a little, uh, a little thinner. And maybe just set just a little bit differently, uh, I guess to account for the different spot that the trigger sits in the, in the gun. Uh, I wasn't expecting that to be different. The disconnector geometry seems unchanged, but the firing pin block uh, lifter seems to be different. Now we're gonna go off camera for real. I'm gonna do the tweak to the trigger safety a little bit. Uh, might have to come back and reassemble a couple times just to get it just right. Uh, it's definitely a Goldilocks situation. You don't wanna screw that one up and go too far. In my unprofessional opinion, here's I can tell it doesn't seem to impact the actual safety of the gun. The trigger safety still functions. It's got plenty of spring pressure behind it. Um, and it really does take the correct kind of um, pull to take care of it. And you can hear my cat. So now we're going to talk about how to modify the trigger safety. And in the interest of full disclosure, this is actually a few days from uh, when the rest of the video was recorded. I've already modified it with the two test fits that you'll see coming up in the video. How After my first live fire session though, I was still having some issues, especially when trying to run the trigger fast. So we're going to take a little bit more material off. The important part here is the back part of the trigger safety right here. See, it's a right angle and it needs to stay a right angle. If this starts to really get rounded at the edge, then you're going to have a bad time because the trigger safety could slip when it should be engaged uh, and cause the gun to go off when you don't intend it to. So in order to maintain drop safety, we have to be very, very careful about how much material we take off here. And again, the, the problem is caused when the trigger is pulled and the trigger moves backwards enough that this piece contacts the frame, 
before you have fully depressed it. So if that happens, especially with this trigger, it's got such a short uh, distance to travel that it will, almost as soon as you start moving the trigger, uh, run into the frame. So the area we're going to be removing material from is this first little piece of the underside of it here. And you can actually sort of see a little bit of silver where uh, I did the material removal before. I uh, put some Sharpie on it earlier to kind of cover it up. But we're going to take this silver Sharpie and we're going to kind of just coat really that little tiny piece right there so that we know uh, what area we're removing material from and can keep track of how much material has been removed. Likewise, I made a similar uh, mark on the back. That's more of an indicator to me, not so much that I need to remove material back here, but I need to clean up that edge just in case there's any deformation from the uh, filing or sanding we're going to do. So there are two methods we can use, one of which is probably better for beginners and the other is for the not faint of heart, extremely experienced folks among you. Um, I personally actually do most of this work with a uh, rotary tool at an extremely low speed, literally the lowest speed it'll go with a, with a sanding disc. And I'm very, very light with my touch and very, very careful. It is extremely easy when you're doing that to either round off this edge or take way too much material off. So if you don't know what you're doing, I recommend using a file and very, very slowly taking material off. So if you've got yourself a needle file set, that should do the trick. Uh, you've got plenty of different sizes. Uh, you will have the most luck if you hold the trigger safety blade out with your finger and like and sort of pinch it uh, because that will keep this elevated above this part of the trigger right here. If you, if you depress it and you don't have anything supporting it, then you will end up with um, like some, some marks down here and potentially not get enough of the material. So filing was done off camera because it's really difficult to record, but you see I've just reduced that amount of material just a little bit more. It's shiny now. You'll notice here on the back, I did some cleanup, but you really don't see a whole lot of uh, material removed at all because it's truly just getting any sort of, um, almost like flashing or I don't really know what to call it, uh, material spillage from the filing up here and make sure that this stays nice and clean and smooth. A uh, good thing to do would be to take like your fingernail and run it down the back edge of this, like I'm doing here, and see if you feel any snags. Uh, do it in a couple different spots on that back edge just to make sure that you feel it nice and smooth and then do the same thing from back here. There shouldn't be any like big uh, burrs or anything. Burrs is probably the word I was looking for. But this will move freely. And again, not that much stuff taken off. And if you look, you can see it's still nice uh, right angle. So one other thing from this uh, vision from the future. So I've actually changed out to the Overwatch trigger return spring, the red one for the slightly heavier trigger pull from the Sprinko, because of something I forgot. With the Sprinko springs, you are actually more likely to have an issue with the trigger safety at an awkward position. The reason being, with the lighter resistance on the trigger, it is easier to pull the trigger back and hit the back of the frame where the trigger safety will bind if you didn't have it fully depressed. With a little bit more spring pressure, it's a little bit more difficult to do that. So that little bit of difference might actually be the difference between you needing to do more modifications or less modifications or none at all. Just food for thought, uh, your desires and results may vary. This is my first test fitting. One thing that you can do is actually to avoid having to reassemble the whole gun. You just want to install the sear housing pin. You don't have to get it totally perfect, just get it in enough to hold it. And you don't even have to install the locking block or anything else like that. Just install your um, slide stop, which is your pivot pin for the trigger. and play with where's your finger have to get. 
So I'm actually pretty close um, on the first try. Just need to take a little more material off. And here is, I think, going to be the finished product. All right, and uh, just based off of some testing already done so far, this feels like it's about the right spot. If I go too high on the trigger, it's still a little intermittent, depending on how I hit it. So uh, it's possible that I'm going to end up still taking this apart and doing a little bit more. Um, probably not until I've done a couple live fire sessions just to get a feel for it. But, I mean, this thing is sweet. That's like, that's nothing. Seriously. Uh, this reminds me very favorably of my uh, CZ Checkmate uh, or my Cage and Ice Shadow 2 that I used to have. Uh, and, I mean, that gun was just absolutely unreal in single action. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really happy. So it's been a few days since I recorded the first part of the video. I still haven't taken this to the range. In fact, I'm about to leave the house to do that now, but I wanted to get my initial impressions before the range session recorded. So I'm super impressed with this trigger to start with. I was also impressed with the factory trigger. And then when the Overwatch trigger came along, I think it really took it to the next level. But if I had to pick one to start with today, it kind of depends on your budget. So at the time I'm recording this, uh, late November 2020, the dynamic trigger is available for about 140 bucks. The Overwatch TAC trigger is 199. Now the TAC trigger comes with the MP3 coated trigger bar, as well as the two trigger return springs, one sort of like a medium weight for defensive purposes, and one lighter one for competition and range toy use. The dynamic trigger doesn't come with any of that stock. The dynamic trigger, when you use it with the stock fire control, is actually really, really similar to the Overwatch trigger, with the differences being the uh, trigger safety blade being a little bit more finicky unless you modify it. Uh, again, I've never had an issue with that with the Overwatch trigger in tens of thousands of rounds. So with the Overwatch, again, it rests right around 90 degrees. The pressure on the trigger to the wall takes it a little bit past 90, and then you have the wall for a few degrees, and then it breaks. Now with the dynamic trigger, I'm gonna to have to kind of pretend here because I've got the dynamic sear back in and I'm not taking this whole thing back apart. So you're sitting a little bit forward to 90. This part here that's take up for me right now with the dynamic sear in would be right at the wall or very close to at the wall, like maybe the wall would start here. So again, just a little bit forward to 90. You'd go through the wall for a little bit and then trigger breaks right at 90. Some people want it to break right at 90. Some people are okay with it breaking a little bit past 90. I'll be honest, I haven't made up my mind yet as to which I really prefer. I think the dynamic trigger really comes into its own when you're using it in concert with the dynamic fire control. That's really how this trigger was intended to be used. Uh, the fire control, I want to say, was another 75 bucks. Comes with a trigger spring. Again, I didn't even try that trigger spring. It could be lighter, it could be heavier, it could be somewhere in between. Don't know, don't care. So I'm running the dynamic fire control with it, and I've been dry firing it for a couple days, and I'm just absolutely in love, uh, especially after modifying the trigger safety. If you're the kind of person that doesn't like to modify the trigger safety, or is going to be carrying this for defensive purposes, I would honestly say, as of right now, my impression is go overwatch. Now, if you've got really long fingers and depressing this trigger safety consistently isn't going to be a concern for you, then by all means, go for it, use this, probably won't have a problem. But uh, I, I can tell you right now, I would not carry with this trigger as it sits from factory or even really after the modification. I would have no hesitation about carrying with the Overwatch trigger. It eliminates the concern about the trigger safety for me, gives me a flat face trigger with a good enough trigger pull for defensive purposes. So I'm planning on keeping it for my defensive guns. And then for my competition guns, Pending the outcome of uh, my continued testing at the range over the next few weeks, I'm thinking that this is going to become my standard trigger, including the fire control group for all my competition guns. I just feel like the dynamic trigger and the fire control group with it is just like the absolute winning combination here. I've tried a lot of great striker fire triggers. Uh, I've always felt that the Walthers were really the, the best one out there, although you could definitely get like a SIG X5 or 
uh, even a Canic TP9 to be uh, very similar in terms of, of quality of trigger pull, lightness of trigger pull, consistency, uh, short reset. But uh, this is just like on a different level. So this is going to be my new standard, barring something unforeseen happening during the range trips. Now, look for more videos from me in the next couple weeks as I take this to the range a few times. I'll hopefully have some on-the-range footage in addition to some after-action report wrap-ups. Talk about what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, what I'm getting used to, and how things go. So I'm looking forward to going through all that information in the next video. So hopefully I see you then. If you like this video, like it, comment, subscribe, whatever you want to do. You can tell me I did a great job, terrible job, somewhere in between, and uh, tell me what you want to see more of. I originally intended this channel just to be a place for me to put my competition shooting videos. And after making my first one or two author videos to help out some people on a Facebook group, uh, it appears that it's kind of taken off. So I have decided to kind of change up the, the content to be a little bit more focused, not just on competition shooting, but on firearms in general. So I guess the content's going to kind of be all over the place for a while uh, while I figure out what people like and what I'd like to do. So looking forward to going on this journey with all of you, and I'll see you in the next one.